Hello, welcome to the Thursday, April 22nd, 2021 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Well, and starting today again with yet another software supply chain issue. Open source software, of course, was uh, sort of in the focus of software supply chain issues for a long time because many of these open source projects are really based more on trust than actual code reviews. And if uh, parts of the community feel that trust is violated, of course, uh, the reaction can be quite harsh. And uh, this is what researchers at the University of Minnesota are currently experiencing. Late last year, researchers at the University of Minnesota uh, did experiment with a project they called Hypocrite Commit that affected the uh, Linux kernel. They identified a couple of patterns that in the past have led to security vulnerabilities. And based on these patterns, they created patches which they submitted to the Linux mailing list. In Linux, usually patches are first discussed on these mailing lists before they're actually being added as a commit to some Git repository. In this case, whenever a maintainer essentially indicated that the patch looks good and was essentially approved, the researchers then pointed out why the patch shouldn't be approved. So in this case, it was never actually committed to Git. So it was kind of the safe procedure they came up with in order to test their hypotheses if it's possible to introduce these vulnerabilities into the Linux kernel without actually modifying the production Linux code. And this looked all good. They went public with this in December. In February, their paper was published. And earlier this week, a kernel maintainer decided to no longer accept any commits from the University of Minnesota and to undo hundreds of commits already submitted by these researchers, but also by other contributors from the University of Minnesota. So now there's a pretty strong discussion about whether or not this reaction was appropriate and not. On one side, of course, there are the proponents of the trust idea that basically state if you are messing with the Linux kernel, even if uh, this particular experiment did not introduce any vulnerabilities, it's probably time to revoke the trust that the University of Minnesota has been afforded so far. And of course, it's sort of one of those schools that has a long history in contributions to open source software. Supporters on the other side, of course, are stating that these researchers did make some important points and discover uh, some important weaknesses, also uh, suggested important workarounds that the Linux kernel needs to address and that they did conduct their research in a responsible manner. What really comes down to in the end is whether or not an important project like the Linux kernel should be used at all for research like this, because after all, it's often not necessarily what actually happens, but really the appearance of what happens that does affect trust more than anything else. And when it comes to software supply chain security, trust, of course, is a very difficult issue uh, these days, whether or not you're dealing with open source or commercial software. Overall, in my opinion, the finding that the software patches aren't really reviewed all that well, well, that's nothing really all that new. And the patterns that they submitted weren't necessarily all that terribly easy uh, to identify. But uh, yes, uh, there probably should be some improvement in how reviews are being done and how maybe automated tools are to be used in order to avoid some vulnerabilities like this from being introduced. I don't remember about a week or so ago, I talked about how Xavier found in VirusTotal some odd little ransomware fragment written in PowerShell that simply used 7-zip to encrypt files. And 7-zip, of course, like most compression software, has a quick little encryption mode. 
Turns out that the latest version of QLocker, QLocker usually refers to ransomware that runs on QNAP storage devices and encrypts files that are stored on these devices. Well, it uses 7-zip to encrypt the files. Not running in PowerShell as far as I know, because these devices typically run Linux, uh, but the effect is the same. The device is encrypted using a passphrase and 7-zip in order to accomplish the encryption. QNAP has more details about this particular ransomware and uh, workarounds as well as in the case of compromise. Apparently a recent vulnerability for which a patch is available is used in order to install this ransomware. And well, then I have to squeeze at least one vulnerability that is already being exploited into the podcast. Uh, that seems to be sort of a theme this week. Chrome came out with an update that publishes a vulnerability that was uh, publicly posted on Twitter a week ago. This vulnerability uh, can be used to execute arbitrary code. And uh, well, there is a patch available for it now. So update as soon as possible or let just uh, Chrome do its automatic update thing. And well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.